Paris was a striking city in the second half of the 19th century, with fashionable restaurants, cabarets, and theaters offering plays about a prodigious, frivolous, carefree society. The Industrial Revolution generated wealth. Fortunes were made and unmade on the stock market. People spent without counting, and art became ultra-fashionable. After London and New York, Paris finally hosted the World's Fair and combined it with the Salon des Beaux-Arts. On the opening evening, on May 15, 1855, the name Gustave Courbet was on everyone's lips. Although several of his works were on show, the canvas he had painted especially for the Salon was refused by the judges. Let's go back in time to the spring of 1854. Courbet is working with enthusiasm on a painting he is convinced will not go unnoticed. A composition of almost six by four meters, as ambitious as its title is discreet. The artist's studio. What do we see? Courbet in the middle of his studio, painting, surrounded by a small crowd. His friends on one side, among whom we recognize the poet Charles Baudelaire and the philosopher Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. On the other side, a motley bunch of tradesmen, huntsmen, beggars, and priests. What story is Courbet trying to tell with this painting? To find out, we must examine the figures, gestures, and faces hidden within the canvas. To pierce the secrets of the work in order to understand what it is telling us about its painter and his period. Courbet described his project in a letter to his great friend, the author Jean Fleury, also present in the scene. It's society at highest, lowest, and most average. In a word, it's my way of seeing society in its interests and passions. It's the world coming to be painted in my studio. In another letter to Alfred Bruyat, a patron from Montpellier, also in the scene, he added, it makes it the most surprising painting one can imagine. There are 30 life-size figures. It's the moral and physical tale of my studio. Let's look at the painting. It's ordered like a day of judgment scene, with Courbet painting in the center, like God weighing up souls. The chosen are on the right, and the damned on the left. Is it that simple? Surely not. But we'll come back to that. Let's focus on the center of the work. The painter and his easel, on which is a landscape innocently observed by a small shepherd wearing clogs. It's a landscape of the Franche-Comté, Courbet's home region. A provincial who moved to Paris, Gustave Courbet was certain of his talent. When he arrived in the capital aged 20, he had only one thing in mind, to succeed. He wrote to his parents, I want all or nothing. Within five years, I must have made a name for myself in Paris. Often the own subject of his works, he experimented with various artistic paths. He openly painted himself as a handsome, dark young man obsessed by his art. This series of self-portraits was a way of standing out from the pack. This native of Ornon, born in 1819 into a family of wealthy landowners, espoused the socialist ideas of progressive intellectuals. 
Within a few years, the handsome, romantic, and idealistic young man of his beginnings had become a kind of potentate of rebellion, a workaholic who nevertheless loved to party with booze and women. In 1855, despite criticism from the art world for his excesses and egocentricity, Courbet couldn't care less. All Paris was talking about him. Well or badly, it didn't matter. Courbet's provocation was much more than posturing. He was self-taught, and despite his fondness for the classical and romantic artists who preceded him, he didn't balk at breaking the rules of academic painting. In 1850, with A Burial at Ornon, he overturned the famous hierarchy of genre by depicting a common village scene as an epic historical event. Sacrilege, they cried. With the artist's studio, he definitively exploded the rule laid out in 1667 by the French Academy of Fine Arts. What is the hierarchy of genre? It places on the highest rung ambitious compositions with religious, mythological, and historical subjects which convey a moral message. Here, all the genres are included. Firstly, the noblest. Religious painting with the Day of Judgment composition, as we mentioned earlier but also a strange descent from the cross. Then, the scenes of daily life, so-called genre scenes, with exotic customers gathered around a ragman. Of course, the portrait with him in the center surrounded by this curious gallery of about 30 people. Then the landscape, represented by the painting within the painting. After, the central nude, a nod to classical or allegorical painting. Not forgetting animal painting with the magnificent white cat. And finally, the least noble of genre, still life, represented by the hat and guitar lying on the floor, and a memento mori with the skull placed on a crumpled newspaper. By choosing to paint a large size work, Courbet elevated the artist's studio to the level of an historical painting. And as if that weren't enough, he added a secondary title, a real allegory summing up seven years of my artistic and moral life. Courbet thus used the principle of allegory to posit not an abstract idea, but a vision formed directly from his own life. But what are these seven years Courbet mentioned? The artist is sending us back to February 1848. Across Europe, anger was increasing and people were rising up. In France, there was a revolution. The July monarchy was overturned by the Liberals and Republicans. A provisional government was set up, and the Second Republic proclaimed.
Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, elected by a general all-male election, became the first president of the French Republic. Courbet and his friends believed in the fledgling republic. The artist began working on a painting, Firemen Running to a Fire, inspired by Rembrandt's The Night Watch, in which he portrays Louis Napoleon Bonaparte as a firefighter captain saving the people. But the work was left unfinished. On December 2nd, 1851, Almost 50 years after his uncle, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte proclaimed himself Emperor of France under the name Napoleon III and established an authoritarian regime. This coup d'etat was seen as a betrayal. Because Courbet had always supported the Republicans, he earned the reputation of being a dangerous rebel of 48 but he had been far from taking to the streets. He was a confirmed anti-militarist. He wrote to his parents, I will not fight, first because I do not believe in war, rifles and cannons, and because it is not in my principles. I have been fighting a war of intelligence for 10 years now. The second reason is that I own no weapons and I will not be tempted to. With his strong stance and sweeping declarations, Courbet represented a new figure in the art world, the committed artist. Without forgetting to stay in the good books of the powers that be and remain an excellent businessman, he willingly welcomed rich bourgeois couples and new industrialists to tour his studios in a carriage. His studio on the Rue Hauteville was much visited. There, Courbet had always ruled the roost. Visitors included journalists, authors, and philosophers, amongst whom the painter provoked animated debates. Intellectuals rubbed shoulders with patrons commissioning works. Charles Baudelaire was a trusty and longtime caller at the studio. The poet thought of art criticism as a literary discipline in its own right. In his writings, he appraised and appreciated works with his feelings and elective affinities. Courbet threw marvelous parties. People read poetry aloud, the beer flowed, and guests took turns at the piano while Courbet revealed his latest paintings. His portraits were snatched up and became highly popular. Of his other paintings provoked hilarity or incomprehension. Like his 1852 bathers, who were likened to draft horses in a horrified press. Caricaturists freely poked fun at this new painting and its author. The judgment of Alexandre Dumas fils was unequivocal. From what fabulous meeting of a slug with a peacock, from what genital antithesis, from what fatty oozings can have come this thing called Monsieur Gustave Courbet, this imbecilic and impotent incarnation of the self? The writer Maupassant accused Courbet of painting in a fat, dirty way. Unfair. Courbet was also painting, like Raphael, to create a delicate texture. As Jean Fleury said, with Courbet's brush, a woman appears with more frankness than she affords herself before her looking glass. Courbet always sought something else. He worked with a wild energy and cared little for what was considered proper. As the painter Alexandre Chan told us, he painted with a brush, a knife, a cloth, even his thumb. Anything was all right. Between the classical Ingres and the romantic Delacroix, Courbet revolutionized painting by paving a third way, realism. As he stated himself, I insist that painting is an essentially concrete art 
and can only consist in the reproduction of things that really exist. An abstract object, non-visible, non-existent, has no place in painting. But Courbet refused to be a standard bearer. As always, his own freedom took precedence. The label of realist has been forced on me in the same way that the men of 1830 were labeled romantics. In any time, labels have never given a fair idea of things. I have studied outside of the system and without prejudice the art of the ancients and the moderns. Learn in order to be able, that was my belief. To be able to translate customs, ideas, the look of my era according to my appreciation. To be not only a painter, but as a man, in a word, to create living art. That is my aim. Let's go back to 1855. The opening of the Salon is approaching. Courbet is stretched for time. It's the moral and physical tale of my studio, he repeated in a letter to Chonfleury. I have two and a half months to finish it, and if my count is correct, that means two days per figure. As you can see, I will not be having fun. Did Courbet believe he was strong enough? To complete the artist's studio on time, he began a real race against time. He began with collages. He used already existing paintings for some of the portraits. Baudelaire and his childhood friend, the violinist Alphonse Promayer, whom he had painted several years earlier. To represent his patron, Alfred Boyard, he drew inspiration from his portrait of Boyard in profile. Courbet wrote to him, You occupy a magnificent place. You are triumphant and a commander. The painters of Besançon came to see it. They were bowled over, struck by our two profiles. Boyard seemed to share the same narcissistic obsession as Courbet. He had 34 portraits of himself painted, four by Courbet, but also by Delacroix, Couture, and Cabanel. The son of a banker, this connoisseur from Montpellier, spent his fortune on paintings by Millet, Rousseau, Diaz, and Delacroix. While Courbet was working on the artist's studio, Boya was busy with the presentation at the World's Fair of The Meeting, or Bonjour Monsieur Courbet, painted the previous year, which he hoped would cement his friendship with the painter and his status as a patron of the arts. Critics and public alike would mock the painting, seeing it as evidence of the artist's vanity. The meeting by Courbet, the most bent of the three figures, is not the one we think he is. Boyard was extremely bitter about this reception and broke off all relations with the painter only two years after meeting him. In his work on the artist's studio, Courbet also turned to a process which was then a state-of-the-art technology, photography. Invented in 1826 by Nicephore Nips, then commercialized in 1839 by Louis Daguerre, this revolutionary process was considered by numerous painters as direct competition which could lead to a loss in earnings. Courbet didn't share the fears of his fellow artists and used photography to prepare his scene setting. In the artist's studio, the central nude was inspired by a photo. Despite the lack of time, X-ray analysis has revealed several touch-ups. Some features disappeared, some background paintings, and a shelf with some objects on it, leaving a bare wall at height, which the painter Jean-Jacques Henné would later describe as a background that even Velasquez could not have painted better. And notably, one figure was removed from the group. Possibly Baudelaire's mistress, Jeanne Duval. Did the renowned poet refuse to publicize his private life? The painting was finished just in time. Courbet had it delivered at the very last minute to the Salon of the World's Fair. The verdict fell. Refused. 
Although 11 of his paintings were included in the official selection, Courbet was furious that the artist's studio was absent. He decided to repost. He called on his former patron Bouillard to have his own pavilion built, but in vain. He therefore built it at his own expense, named it the Pavilion of Realism, and presented 40 or so of his paintings. Just why was the work refused? The qualities of the painting were widely recognized, as Eugène Delacroix testified. I went to see the Courbet exhibition, which he has reduced to a 10 sous event. I stayed there alone for almost an hour and discovered that his refused painting is a masterpiece. I could not take my eyes off it. The Salon has rejected one of the most original works of our time. We don't know the real reason behind the refusal. The 11 accepted works by Courbet already occupied a large place in the official exhibition. Was the artist's studio simply too big? Or did the worthy members of the jury see this painting as a protest against Napoleon III? Too many persona non grata are represented in it. Courbet put fervent Republicans opposed to the regime in the forefront, starting with his friend and socialist thinker, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, who after the 1848 revolution began a career in politics. Elected to Parliament, he demanded, among other things, the founding of a national bank capable of centralizing and regulating finance and a fairer distribution of wealth. He claimed that the ownership of production means was allowing capitalists to steal from the workers the fruits of their labors, and summed it up in the lapidary expression, property is theft. He accused the press of being a graveyard of ideas, a formula that Courbet recalled by painting the skull on the crumbled edition of the Journal des Débats. After his death in 1865, Proudhon's doctrine spread across Europe, influencing first Karl Marx and then all the new socialist movements. Courbet thus placed Proudhon to his right, with all the activist shareholders, friends, workers, and lovers of art. If that is true, then what about those to his left? It's a complex and intriguing gallery. Over the following decades, it gave rise to numerous fiercely bitterly debated interpretations. The huntsman wearing the red striped scarf, the reaper and the laborer could incarnate a map of revolutionary Europe and nations that were rising up. The Jew holding a box, the priest, the undertaker, and the ragman could conceal Second Empire figures depicted with the critical eye of the artist. Few people agree on these identifications, save for the gamekeeper with his dog in the foreground. He can be no other than Napoleon III. Beyond the physical resemblance, we can tell it's Napoleon III from his boots, a giveaway sign of the emperor. So much so that in some caricatures, the presence of a single boot was enough to personify him. But why did no observer of the time allude to this emperor-like gamekeeper? Due to censorship the strictest that France had ever known. The mere fact of suggesting the figure of Napoleon III could have been judged as treason and been punished with a prison sentence for any subject of the emperor. But also, more simply, because a too rigid or too political analysis of the work would go beyond the real intentions of the artist. Courbet's painting is first and foremost imaginative it fits perfectly with the definition of poetry by his friend Charles Baudelaire. Poetry, under pain of death or decay, cannot assimilate herself to science or ethics. She has not truth for object. She has only herself. Though the full critical weight of the artist's studio leaves no doubt, the work itself maintains all its mystery and contradictions. As Courbet wrote, 
It is passably mysterious. Guess as you will.